Mr. Nick Scartarossi. Hello, my name is Nick Scartarossi. I'm an actor, I'm a comedian, and if you live in this building, I'm your neighbor. It was in this courtyard in Los Angeles, California, where last summer I was able to film my debut comedy special, Thin Walls, An Evening with My Neighbors in the Middle of a Pandemic. This is the story of how that happened. Before we begin though, I, I do want to address one thing. This talk is not a celebration of what I did, but rather a retelling of the process that I went through in creating this. We're going through an incredibly taxing time, both mentally and emotionally. And if you're an artist that finds yourself unable to create right now, that's absolutely okay. I don't get a badge of honor just because I made this. This is just the story of how I did it. Now, I love stand-up comedy. Before the pandemic, it was a part of my daily routine. I I'm not a household name by any means, but I was lucky enough to perform pretty regularly in Los Angeles. I also hosted a couple of shows. Multiple nights a week, you could find me in a dimly lit room on stage telling jokes to people I had never met in my entire life. It was incredible. Off stage, though, was kind of a different story. I was growing pretty disillusioned with the progress in my career, and in turn, it was becoming somewhat of an isolating experience. Instead of hanging out and collaborating with friends, I became so focused on getting the validation of talent bookers and people within the industry. Then COVID-19 hit, and almost overnight, stand-up comedy and my career stopped. To make matters worse, I was about to turn 30. Now, I want to pause right here. 30 is not a bad age. I love 30. 30 is fantastic. But 30 is an age when you do start to wonder things out loud, like, you know, what have I done with my life? Have I made anything that I'm proud of? Was getting a degree in theater and then pursuing a career in comedy maybe a bit of a mistake in retrospect? In a panic, I decided to call one of my best friends, John Zucker, and reach out to him about creating a comedy special. I got on the phone and I was very nervous. I said, John, I'm freaking out. I don't know if comedy's coming back. I don't know what my career looks like. I think that we should make a comedy special in the courtyard of my building and I want you to direct it. It was very straightforward. It was very intense, very Hollywood. That's how we do things here. Now, John agreed and we knew that if we were going to do this, we would have to form a crew and we would have to do it fast. The November presidential elections were right around the corner, and we knew that the news would be dominated by that. And so we set off to produce, film, edit, and release a comedy special in a little over a month and a half. Now that might make it seem like it was a very quick and unplanned process, and it was, but you know, John and I had hosted a comedy show for a couple of years. We had made a short film. How hard could this be? Very hard. Now when you're starting to make a comedy special, one of the first ingredients that you want to find is people to film it. Luckily, this was actually one of the easiest parts. Uh, because I live in LA, I actually have access to one very important thing. I have friends with incredibly nice cameras. And like that, we brought on Zach Foster, Greg Hollander, and Mark Sandoval as our main three camera setup, with my neighbor Lem Thomas and my friend Nee Kirschman providing additional camera support. The next ingredient is sound. We knew that we would be making this special outside in the middle of the day in a city, so the chances of interruption were incredibly high. You have to take it from me here, there is nothing that people like to interrupt more than someone standing outside with a microphone. Through a recommendation, we met up with fellow stand-up comedian and sound designer Mark Debanis, and our crew was set. It wasn't lost on me that the crew was mostly comprised of people that I had actually met through comedy. I was quickly finding out that unlike my past approach, if I wanted to make something, it was okay to reach out to people and that they were willing to help. The next thing we needed to figure out was where the cameras and the microphones would go. Because of COVID-19, any meeting that we had in person came with the additional risk of potential exposure, so we kept everything online. We sent this picture out to the crew to give them an initial idea of what the setup would look like. The red X's represented where the audience would sit and they would wear masks and be at least six feet apart, while well, the purple word cam represented where our main three camera setup would go, while the yellow X represented where I would stand for the performance. And that's a nice segue into one of the most important parts of a comedy special, the material. And this actually came with a couple of challenges. Because stand-up comedy wasn't really happening at the time, I had no way to test out to see if my material would work. One of the ways around that was by stitching together audio of old comedy sets that I had done and sending it out to people in the comedy community that I trusted. I was blown away by some of the notes that I got, which caused me to change things from small jokes to complete structural changes. Again, I found out that comedy didn't have to be a lonely experience. I was better for the fact that I was finally collaborating. But still, there were some questions. I mean, how much was I going to joke about COVID-19? Was it still too fresh in people's minds, or were the best jokes already taken? 
The way that we got around this was that I would use jokes from my old material that I would retrofit to fit this moment. Uh, for example, one of the most common premises I used to use to start a set was by saying, the other day my girlfriend accidentally called me mom. Now, it's a premise based off of a true story that I would use to set up other jokes in my set. With the backdrop of the pandemic though, I had to make it more universal. So instead of saying the other day, the joke was about living with my girlfriend in our apartment during this time. This is how it turned out. Yeah. I've, a, I've had a weird pandemic so far. Uh, my girlfriend and I, we've lived in this building with a lot of you guys uh, uh, for four years. And like, <clears throat> we've been handling it, I think, pretty well. You know, we, we've been communicating a lot more. Uh, we got a puppy, you know, we're living in harmony. It's just great, right? Uh, and then the other day, she accidentally called me mom. Uh, that was a weird moment for our relationship. You know what I mean? I didn't expect that. Now, that might make it seem like a seemingly small, insignificant change, but by doing so, I was able to rest the joke in this world without beating the audience over the head with it. And that brings me to the final and most important ingredient in any comedy special, the crowd. Stand-up comedy is almost singularly unique in terms of its interaction with the audience. If you're having a great set, they're gonna let you know it. If you're having a bad set, they are also, unfortunately, gonna let you know it. We had to find a group of people that were not only COVID compliant, but willing to come to a show in the middle of a pandemic. And we found one in this building, my neighbors. So we were set. We had the crew, we had the material, we had the audience, but still something was missing. Yes, this was my special, but it was happening in a moment that we were all experiencing. In a brilliant moment, John suggested that we interview some of my neighbors and stitch the interviews throughout the special. In doing so, we learned stories of people reconnecting with friends and family, how they were spending their time in quarantine, and what their plans were when this was all over. I remember at one point I, when we were filming him, I turned to John and I said, if my jokes are half as good as these interviews, I think we have something really unique on our hands. The special had been born out of my fears of isolation and the unpredictability of the future, but it was quickly becoming this wonderful collaborative event between me, the people helping to create it, and now the audience watching it. Instead of a comedy special, we ended up with kind of a comedy time capsule. About a week before the performance was the only time that the crew and I could get together to run through everything face to face. We wanted to make sure that it was good to go top to bottom, but even with all of that preparation, by the time I took the stage on September 5th, I was so nervous. I hadn't performed stand-up comedy in almost six months by that point. Thankfully, all the work that we had put in culminated into one of the most fun experiences I have ever had on a stage. What followed was a very quick editing process and the release of the special online, which quickly garnered thousands of views and was picked up by publications like the AV Club, Time Out LA, the Michigan Daily, and was recently named one of the 100 best things in comedy in 2020 by the Comedy Bureau. And finally, a TED Talk. In the end, a moment of panic led me to reach out to a friend and create something more collaborative than I ever thought possible. In the past, my solution was sort of doing things by myself. I waited for people to give me permission to create. But by reaching out to my friends and engaging in a process that involved me and everyone around it, I was able to create something that I've never been more proud of. So I will leave you with this. If you have a neighbor and it's socially distant and possible, reach out to them. Call a friend you haven't talked to in a long time. You're not as alone as you think you are. Thank you so much.